Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and a random Eastern Front week in what is essentially going to be a Pacific week. But 80 years ago, this very week, the Siege of Leningrad ended, a story of human tragedy and endurance and military um, uh, operations on an enormous scale. And there's only one person I'd want to discuss it, a World War II TV superstar. And here he is. Good evening, sir. How are you today, Pritt? Well, what a fantastic introduction. Thank you, Woody. It's lovely to be here. And hello to everybody. Um, uh, good to see um, several familiar faces on the chat. And in honour of you, Pritt, I'm having a bit of a a bit of a single malt while I while you're talking. It's uh, it's Tuesday evening. I've worked hard all day. A bit of yeah. bell Benny today, but um, absolutely, you've earned it, mate. Thank you. So, folks, we will do questions kind of as we go along. But you know, you know how good my guest is. He'll probably cover most of the things you want to ask as he's going along. But you know feel free to join in with your comments. But um, I'll be in charge of PowerPoint, so tell me when to nudge on the slides. But basically, this is uh, this is all over to my guest. So, um, Pritt, how, where you go? Well, um, we're going to be talking primarily about January 1944. But to start with, I'm going to take you back one year earlier to um, the beginning of 1943. So if we could jump to the first slide. bit busy, but... The point here is that you can see right in the north here, um, Leningrad is pretty much cut off. Um, the uh, Germans have three uh, army corps stationed to the south of it, one screening what became known as the Iranian bound bridgehead further to the west, and then the rest of the Red Army is away to the east. And in January uh, 1943, there took place an operation that became known as Iskra in Russian or Spark in translation. And this is at a time when we were having Uranus, uh, Little Saturn, Mars, etc. So why was it called Spark? According to the Soviet memoirs, um, it was Stalin's idea because this would be the spark that um, ignited the fire that drove the enemy out of uh, the Soviet Union. OK, I have no idea how true that is or, or not, but it's a, it's a damn good story. So if we jump on to the next slide, Paul, um, th these are the two of the main players we're going to um, we're going to talk about. Um, Gordy, your comments on uh, Starlecker, uh, please, could you raise that towards the end? And I'll come back to that because it's a fascinating rabbit hole and I don't want to disappear down it and then uh, get told off for running late. Um, on our left here is Marshal Leonid Govorov, who by now is commander of Leningrad Front. He commands the garrison, um, the armies that have been deployed in Leningrad and the Iranian bound uh, bridgehead. And he is now uh, preparing to break out. They have been trying to break the siege all the way through 1942 at enormous expense uh, without ever achieving anything. Um, opposing him is uh, the man on the right, uh, uh, General Oberst Kuchler, uh, who has been in, com in command of Army Group North since the very beginning of 1942. Um, and... What can I say? He and his chief of staff, uh, Kinsel, are enjoying a fairly relaxed life. They have settled into, um, uh, into a former palace in the city of Peskov, and they have a leisurely breakfast every morning, followed by an equally leisurely sitrep, and then they discuss how, many, how they're going to kill the Russians today. And they've been doing a reasonably good job of it, and the Red Army's made no impression on the siege perimeter all the way through 1942. But the first winter is now behind them, the terrible winter when the city very, very nearly fell. Um, after that, it's really been um, not exactly easy street, but things have steadily improved. The city's population has fallen considerably, largely due to evacuations, but also, of course, due to deaths. It's at a much more manageable level. They're getting enough supplies in. So the second winter, 42 to 43, they're in far better shape. Rations are better managed. Nobody is starving anymore, though there are still plenty of people who are very malnourished from the first winter. However, um, the Germans have been fighting... Um, on the siege perimeter, holding back the Red Army, um, and they've been doing pr so pretty well. But by the beginning of 1943, the divisions around the siege perimeter are beginning to look a little bit threadbare. 
So they don't have the reserves that they had all the way through 42. So it's questionable how well they're going to stand up to the sort of pounding um, that was familiar in the previous year. And this is, you know, really brutal stuff. So yeah, next slide. This is the shore of Lake Ladiger in the north. Leningrad is away to the top left of this picture. And you can see the Germans have this narrow corridor stretching to Lake Ladiger, which is less than 10 miles wide. And that entire area now is massively fortified. Um, defense line after defense line, um, minefield after minefield. The whole thing is at um, only a little bit above the water table. If you dig a trench, um, by the time you're deep enough to get sort of down to shoulder height in your trench, you're at least shin deep in water. Um, it's appalling conditions for both sides to, to fight in. Um, and yet here they are doing so. Um, there have been several battles here in this little neck of land attempting to break this. You can see roughly in the center of the map, the town of Signavino. And there is some high ground around Signavino known as the Signavino Heights. Um, <coughs> When I say heights, we're not talking something like the Highlands where I was happily ensconced last week. We're talking of just some very, very uh, low hills with swampy ground all around them, forests around them. Um, I, um, Stephen, I have actually visited this battlefield some years ago. Um, and you know what? Nothing has really changed. This area still remains very sparsely populated. And the local person who took me around there said that, um, you know, every year people find bits of rusted metal lying around there. Um, by the time we get to early 1943, which is where this story starts, there have already been three or four offensives through the Signovino area. Uh, this is already the graveyard for over two or three hundred thousand people. Um, just an incredible amount of bloodshed for such a small uh, patch of land. So anyway, we're going to try again. And on 12th of January, um, Leningrad Front, starting from the left-hand side of this map, is going to try to storm over the Neva River, which is frozen, of course, and is going to try to batter its way uh, towards um, Volkov Front, which is on the right-hand side, which is going to be fighting towards them. And of course, the Germans know all about this and they know exactly where the attacks are going to come because it's pretty damned obvious where the attacks are going to come. They have massively fortified this whole area and they are waiting and they are ready. The little symbols, the G symbols on this map, these are fortified buildings or strong points that the Germans have variously identified. Some of them are old factories along the Neva or mills or power stations. And the Germans um, have turned these into absolute fortresses. Um, and this is going to be a tough, tough job for the Red Army. But this time, Gavorov reckons he can do it. So the attack begins on the 12th of January. Um, they hammer away uh, for several days. On the first day, they manage to seize uh, bridgeheads over the Neva, and they advance about two miles. But thereafter, progress slows to a crawl. Um, casualties start ramping up and up and up. Um, but this is going to be the <coughs> And they are determined to break the siege ring. And in the lead of the attack is a Soviet division commander called Simonyak, who is um, determined that his men are going to be the boys who actually break the siege. So if we jump on to the next slide now, this is the 16th of January. So the fighting has now been raging for three days. And you can see there's 136th Rifle Division, that's Simonyak's boys. They have pushed most of the way into this neck of land. And from the, the east, um, those three Soviet rifle divisions have also forced their way in. And there is now a gap of barely a mile separating them. Now, the Germans have a problem because they have these groups um, in the north. They have a battle group from SS Politsai, which has arrived as reinforcements. So it's, you know, one of these things where if the Red Army succeeds in linking up, those divisions to the north are trapped. On the other hand, if the Germans hold their positions, the Red Army is then faced with this force that's crossed the Neva River. And once the winter ice melts, it's going to be very difficult keeping that bridgehead alive. Mm -hmm. 
So everything now really hinges on completing this link up and it duly takes place during the 16th of January. And here we are. And this is like one of so many pictures from the Second World War, whether it's raising the red flag over the Reichstag or raising the stars and stripes on Iwo Jima. You know this is a posed picture. Mm. Um, you know, they, they wouldn't have had a camera with them. Um, you know, these guys were... Um, scout patrols from both sides. There are German patrols in the area. There's heavy shell fire. Um, but my goodness, you've got to pose for a picture like this, haven't you? You've got to recreate the moment um, when the garrison links up with the outside. So the German forces that were briefly cut off along the shore of Lake Ladoga succeeded in fighting their way back down to the south. Of course, they had to abandon a lot of their equipment, but nevertheless, they pulled back to the Signorino Heights. And there, the Soviet offensive stalled. Um, Simoniak and the other division commanders were told to assault the heights. Um, they failed to make any impression, not least because their divisions had been bled white, breaking the siege ring. Um, but uh, nevertheless, they had broken the siege perimeter. The problem is, though, from if you go back to the previous slide, Woody, please. Thank you. Um, if you look from Signorino to Lake Ladoga, we're talking of a distance of only four or five miles. Mm. So this is easily within artillery range for the Red Army, uh, for, for the Germans, and they can interdict this area uh, almost at will. The Germans build a, uh, the uh, Soviets build a railway line along the lake shore to get supplies through, but they can only really run trains at night um, because otherwise the Germans will spot them and shell them. Uh, where are supplies coming from to feed the Soviets at this time? Well, Soviet industry has pretty much recovered from the relocation to um, the Caucasus, to the uh, Siberia, to Siberia and uh, to the Urals, but of course there's an enormous amount of Lend-Lease stuff arriving too. Um, remember though that in this sector, um, this is really not tank country, so you don't need huge amounts of tank production. We're talking about artillery ammunition, rifle ammunition, and bodies. This is what it's all about. It's just smashing through these lines. So by the end of January 1943, the siege perimeter has been broken However, the Germans are still within artillery range of Leningrad all the way around the city. They can interdict this tenuous supply line. So this is unfinished business. And during 1943, the Red Army makes a couple of attempts to um, widen that corridor at, at enormous cost and achieves nothing. Um, and we now jump to January 1944. So this is where the siege is finally going to be lifted. Now, this operation I have seen described in several Soviet accounts as a January thunder. Um, I suspect that is a bit of post hoc uh, labeling. I don't think it was called that at the time. It was probably just in uh, you know uh, the tradition that there was at the time. It was a matter of you know uh, this is just the winter operation. Uh, Stuart Burbridge. Um, driving trucks across Lake Ladoga. So um, let me tell you about this. When they established the Road of Life during the first winter, it's worth knowing that actually the, um, the Soviets and the Russians indeed had been building uh, roads and even railways across frozen waterways for nearly 100 years before this. So they were well accustomed to this. In fact, they were very, very well versed in this. They knew for example, you have to uh, run, if you're running a column of trucks across it, they have to have irregular spacing between them. Otherwise, you'll get resonance set up, which will shatter the ice. Um, there you'll find, if you do a quick um, Google Images search, you will find pictures of these truck convoys. And the striking thing is how the drivers are driving with their cab doors open, because if the ice breaks, they need to bail out. Um, but anybody who has be, been near large bodies of frozen uh, water in the winter knows that actually mist is a very common feature around these waters. So although in theory you'd say, yeah, the Luftwaffe could sweep over this, Germans could shell this, actually it's really difficult. You can't because you can't see where they are. And they, eventually they had several roads uh, built across the ice. But anyway, we're digressing. Let's press on because um, we're now getting to the meat of this and January thunder. So here we go with January Thunder, and this is going to be a multi-phase operation. Um, the Red Army has been planning this at some, at some length, and uh, uh, Gavorov and uh, Maslenikov, who's over in uh, Volkov front, have designed two different versions of this plan. Uh, 
Plan one is known as Nieva one, and this is in anticipation of the Germans attempting to retreat back to um, the Estonian frontier. Uh, and it's an attempt to stop them doing so and to trap as many of them as possible um, uh, close to Leningrad where they can be destroyed. They know that the Germans have been fortifying the Estonian frontier, uh, the so-called Panther Line. Um, so they have Nieva 1 set to go that in the first sign of the Germans attempting to withdraw, we're going to hit them hard. Because um, at the end of 1940, in early 43, the Germans had abandoned both the Demiansk salient and the Rezhev salient, and the Red Army had basically let them do it. And there was an absolute determination that this was not going to happen this time, and we're going to hit them very, very hard um, uh, and, and not let, let them pull out. Um, uh, Peter's comment, uh, driving a nice softened by German artillery, it's actually quite difficult to do with artillery um, because, you know, in these sub-zero uh, temperatures, things refreeze very uh, quickly. They had alternative routes. And actually, the Germans are concentrating most of their shell fire on Leningrad itself uh, rather than the supply lines. But anyway, let's carry on with this. Neva 2 was the plan for if the Germans don't withdraw. If they decide to stand and fight, how are we going to do this? Um, and the answer was, we're going to do this as a multi-phase operation. First of all, we have shipped all of Second Shock Army into the Iranian-bound bridgehead, which is this in, uh, enclosed area at the upper left of the map. This was left over from the original German advance on Leningrad, and they had left this thinking it'll wither. There's no need to destroy it. Um, and in fact, it proved to be a real thorn in their side throughout the siege. Now the, um, uh, the, the Soviets have the whole of Second Shock Army in there, um, and it's led by Fedyaninsky, who is one of the better com uh, commanders, and he is ready uh, to uh, execute phase one, which is he is going to fight his way towards Leningrad while 42nd Army fights its way uh, to link up with him. Um, and if they do so, they will then become begin phase two, which if you'll remember, we had all of the, the all of Volkov front um, away to the east. They'll then open up the offensive. So basically the whole of the German position on the northern front, uh, northern sector will then collapse and they'll be driven back towards the Baltic states in some uh, in some ruin. Uh, Robin's question, did Operation Nordlicht have any chance of success? So for those of you who don't know, after he had successfully stormed Sevastopol, uh, Manstein was sent north with um, 11th Army to prepare for an assault with the intention being to widen the, the German corridor that ran to Lake Ladiga. And he was meant to advance up the eastern shore of Lake Ladiga, basically where you can see Leningrad on this map. He would be between Leningrad and the right-hand side of the map. So he would cut the city off from the lake and prevent a recurrence of the first winter. Um, would it have succeeded? I really don't think so. The Soviets knew they were coming. This isn't tank country and German success with infantry assaults was never as impressive as when they could unleash the panzer divisions. Um, besides which, the arrival of 11th Army coincided with the um, a yet another attempt by the Red Army to try to take Sinjavino, and all of those divisions get, gradually got sucked into the fight <clears throat> there. So although the, that, that particular Sinjavino offensive was a failure, um, it served a purpose in that those divisions would otherwise have ended up on the Stalingrad uh, front. So by tying them down here, uh, it actually served a purpose. Um, Stalin did not visit the front line as far as I'm aware. I have never come across a mention of this. He spent all of the war um, either in uh, Moscow or flying off to places like Tehran uh, or Yalta or whatever. Um, he didn't He didn't visit the front line. Um, that's what to people like Zhukov and... Um, and Vasilevsky were for, um, he preferred to stay uh, in Moscow. Anyway, back to 14th of January, where after a heavy artillery bombardment, um, a second shock army begins its assault out of the Iranian-bound bridgehead. And um, through a mixture of good luck and good fortune, they have picked on attacking 
two Luftwaffe field divisions. And uh, those of you who are familiar with this will know that um, these field divisions are seven uh, battalion divisions rather than a regular nine battalion division. They're not particularly well armed, they're not particularly well led, um, and they are generally seen as weak. And towards the bottom of the Iranian Brown Bridgehead, you can also see a third SS Panzer Corps, which is a new formation um, recently raised this his uh, made up of, if you like, the international SS. So we have um, people like the Danes, uh, the Dutch, etc. Um, and these are, but these are new divisions. They are still forming up. They haven't really had any time to shake down. So what are the Germans doing during this time? Well, Kuchler has decided that his infantry divisions are actually pretty worn out. Um, they've had replacement drafts, of course, but these haven't kept up with losses. Um, Nor uh, Army Group North has been given low supply priority, because not least because of the catastrophe that unfolded around Stalingrad. So all of these divisions um, uh, are weak. They were further weakened all the way through 1943. So by the time you get to early 44, he has very, very little by way of reserves. There are only local reserves, the odd battalion um, pulled out uh, from here or there. Um, and he's been asking for a withdrawal to the Panther line. And of course, Hitler is doing his usual thing of, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're you are to stay where you are. And he has repeatedly said, I can't do this. So he then appeals to, uh, if we jump onto the next slide, um, we have two personalities. On the left is Felix Steiner, who is commander of 3rd SS Panzer Corps. Um, he is not one of these SS people who has risen to high position through um, success in killing large numbers of civilians or because he has Himmler's eye or because he's a particularly ideological fascist or Nazi. He's actually one of the people who um, has army experience, Freikorps experience, and he's a very competent commander. He's also an exceedingly competent man when it comes to training. He has run several training uh, units in his time. So in a way, he is the best man to bring um, a, a new SS Corps up to, uh, up to speed, but time is not on his side. On the other side of the map, um, well, everybody, um, a loud round of applause for uh, Lindemann, who's commander of 18th Army, the uh, German army on this front. And this guy um, is not popular in the German army. During uh, Barbarossa, um, he... Uh, uh, his his corps suffered a setback, which he immediately blamed upon his corps artillery commander, uh, even though it was not remotely his fault. So he's not popular. Everyone knows, you know, he's going to dump his subordinates in it if he can. Uh, any Soviet naval gunnery contribution, only indirectly in that they dismounted a lot of the artillery off the ships and put it in the Iranian-bound bridgehead. There were no Soviet warships operating uh, because uh, that channel of water running up to Leningrad was intermittently frozen at this time of year anyway. Uh, um, so they weren't going to venture out there. And in fact, um, uh, uh, Rudel and his Stukas had attacked the uh, uh, Baltic fleet several times uh, with considerable success. The ships weren't really seaworthy. Um, they'd been disarmed. Their guns were deployed on shore. So anyway, um, when he's trying to persuade Hitler that he needs to pull back to uh, the Panther line, um, Kuchler calls upon... Um, Lindemann and says, you know, come on, back me up here. Our divisions are really in no state to stand and fight, are they? Lindemann, of course, thinks, well, Kuchler is probably falling out of favor right now. He's been army group commander for a year. He's due for replacement. And as a local army commander, I wonder who's, you know, going to be in the running for the new post. So he he says, well, mein Führer, my divisions are absolutely up and ready uh, and they can defend themselves and there'll be no problem at all, which of course is exactly what Hitler wants to hear. So he says, see, I told you, no crisis, you're staying where you are. So this is a disaster for um, Kuchler, who wanted to pull back to Estonia, and he's going to have to stand and fight where he is with very little by way of reserves. Um, how easy is it for someone like me to access Russian archives in the moment? It's just not possible at all. Um, uh, what little access I had has now been withdrawn. Um, I have a friend who is uh, an academic in St. Petersburg who can get me some things in exchange for other stuff, um, but even his access is limited. Um, and uh, I will not say no more because if, if word were to get back that he was uh, passing information on to the West, he'd probably have his access 
terminated too. It's a, it's not a nice environment for researchers at the moment. Fortunately, though, I do have quite an arsenal of uh, uh, resources that I've piled up over the years. Um, so I'll carry on dipping into those for the time being. So let's move on to the next map now. Um, I beg your pardon. This is uh, I'm, I'm one of the few people who's going to come out of this episode with any credit. And Maximilian Wengler, at this stage, is an Oberst. He's a colonel. Um, Wengler fought with great distinction during um, uh, Operation Spark and the breaking of the siege ring um, uh, a year before. He held one of those little G positions that were listed uh, even when he was isolated and cut off um, and then succeeded in fighting his way out with his troops and bringing them all out, including their heavy weapons. Um, he is going to feature in the fight. He's one of these guys who, who increasingly comes to the fore at this stage of the war. These men who end up with these eponymous army uh, battle groups named after them where they just scrape together bits and pieces, grabbing retreating units, stragglers, reinforcements, whatever they can, and in a ridiculously short time, putting them to, to good use. Um, on the subject of um, Soviet archives, if uh, Woody will just allow me a very, very brief uh, diversion. Uh, Simon Seabag Montefiore, who of course has written extensively about the Soviet Union and Russia, um, wrote um, at some length about Peter the Great and the Russians. And he was um, uh, told um, that his books had been translated um, by hand into Russian for the benefit of a certain high ranking uh, Russian personage. And you can guess who that was. So when he said, I want to write um, a book about Stalin, um, he was given unlimited access to the archives in Moscow. So he spent a glorious year in Moscow with people you know, running and fetching for him and uh, retrieving stuff, uh, etc. cetera. Um, no, the Finns are still in the fight at the moment, but they're looking for a way out. Um, we'll come, we may come to that later if time allows. Um, but they are still in the fight, but they're not really doing very much at this stage. Anyway, so um, Seabag um, wrote his book and um, returned home and, and it was published. He then learned that uh, it, a copy had been passed to Putin. And because he was not particularly nice about um, uh, Stalin, who he referred to as the Red Tsar in his book, um, he was suddenly persona non grata. All of the people he had contacted in the archives in Moscow didn't want to know him, even to the point of when he phoned them and said, could I speak to so-and-so? Um, uh, my name is Simon Seabag Montefiore. They, he was talking to people he had known the previous year who were saying, Sorry, Simon who? And they, mm. you know, they were completely blanking him. This is um, how things work in the Soviet, in the Soviet Union, what can I say, in Putin's Russia. Um, it's really not a good place. Air power, um, yeah, there's the bits and pieces of air power, um, but we're not talking like Western level of uh, air support. The Germans are still operating Stukas uh, with some effect because you can operate from close behind the air, uh, the front line, and provided the other side isn't mounting continuous combat air patrols um, in the style of the West. Um, you know, the, these uh, obsolescent aircraft can still function. The Soviets are using their Sturmoviks and their PE-2s, etc. But really, air power doesn't play as big a role as it does uh, in the West. So anyway, let's move on. Um, so here we are on the 19th of January. Remember, this offensive started on the 14th. And on the 19th, uh, the two sides actually link up. And you can see they've con made contact here at Talesi. And um, 9th uh, Luftwaffe Field Division and 126th Infantry Division have both been isolated uh, in the north. Um, and 2nd Shock Army has linked up with 42nd Army. And this is a great moment. Um, and leading 42nd Army uh, is none other than our man um, Simoniak, who had led his division with great distinction in the original breaking of the siege ring. His, he is now a corps commander in charge of 30th Guards Rifle Corps, and he has led 42nd Army to link up with 2nd Shock Army. But contact is pretty tenuous. You can see that in theory they've established a corridor that's maybe two or three miles wide, but in effect there's a lot of mixed up stuff in that little space. There are troops of both sides milling around in there and um, and, you know, there's a lot of chaos. Um, so it isn't exactly continuous front lines um, at this stage. In fact, first contact had been made on the 18th and during the 19th, it, uh, contact was strengthened and widened, but it is certainly not um, a solid position by any, any means. 
Events now start to unfold quite rapidly. On the same day um, as this, um, the uh, 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 Lindemann and Kuchlo were given permission to order a breakout by those two divisions that were trapped in the north. They abandoned all of their heavy weapons and heavy equipment, and they managed to uh, uh, break through and link up the 170th Infantry Division to the south. There were elements of 3rd SS Panzer Corps involved in this fighting too, largely because they're the only mobile forces that um, are available in the sector. So they've managed to send, uh, for example, armored reconnaissance battalions, etc., uh, to intervene in the fighting. And the these, these are added to the mix and the chaos of what's happening in that corridor of retreating German units, Soviet units trying to link up, you know, all sorts of chaos. Um, nobody really knows where they are. Um, meanwhile, um, without even having had permission for this, um, the Red Army, uh, the, the Germans now abandon the Sinjavino Heights and pull back to the south um, because they just need to free up troops from somewhere in order to try to keep the line going. The entire front to the east of this map is gradually collapsing now. At first, it's a fairly orderly retreat, but it rapidly starts to break up. Um, the initial Soviet attacks to break through the retreating uh, German lines are actually um, repulsed, um, but they don't actually... Um, uh, hold their position, they're pulling back anyway. And as, as anyone knows, retreating in um, uh, in contact with the enemy is never an easy thing. So the Germans are taking quite heavy losses here. Uh, were the German units rotated out to rest and refit? Well, the panzer divisions were. The poor old infantry certainly weren't. Um, during the, the long years of uh, Army Group North up here, what would happen would be that, um, for example, some of these divisions like 11th Infantry Division there would have would establish a rear camp somewhere, either in um, uh, uh, in uh, Ingerman land, which is the sort of bottom left-hand corner of this map, or over in Estonia, and they would rotate one or two infantry battalions out at a time. So the guys got a break, but the majority of the divisions uh, division would remain in line. It wasn't like you could pull out a whole division. Uh, which also means you've got to absorb replacement drafts in the front line. You don't have the luxury of working up uh, replacements and you know giving them a field exercise to bed down. They're just straight into into the front line. This is so again that degrades the fighting quality of the division. So not only are they getting numerically weaker, they're getting weaker in terms of their um, of their prowess of their of their tactical skill and nous. And like many armies uh, which have a tradition of leading from the front, the the Wehrmacht has been auto-corrupt. I'm stealing that. That's a fantastic um, uh, uh, version. Yes, so that's definitely being stolen. Um, you know, like any army that has a tradition with officers leading from the front, officer casualties in, in the Wehrmacht have been running way ahead of other casualties. So again, that's an enormous loss of uh, expertise, which is, you know, um, which is fatal. So at this stage, our man Wengler comes to the fore. As this front line gradually starts to disintegrate, um, if you if you look at uh, the bottom of the, uh, the um, this sort of a battle line here, you'll see a, a town marked uh, Krasnogvardesk. Uh, this has none, this has no numerous names. It was a scene of a, a battle during the Russian Civil War where Leon Trotsky. Um, uh, managed to uh, defeat a white Russian force. And in honor of him, the town at that time was known as Gatchina, and it was renamed Trotsk. But of course, Trotsky became persona non grata not long after, so it became Krasnogvardesk, or Red Guard Town. Um, as it was being recaptured by the Red Army in this offensive, it was renamed Gatchina. And this was a curious thing. Stalin was rolling back a lot of the revolutionary names for towns and streets, etc., and restoring their old names in order to appeal to, if you like, a sort of sense of folk memory of the of continuity with the Russian past. This is a time when things like uh, the Order of Savorov and some of these old Tsarist medals are being resurrected um, for exactly the same reason. It's all part of this whole business of, of sort of re-establishing, um, you know, the way, the you know, a link with the past, continuity. We defeated the French in the Patriotic War of, uh, 19, of 1812. We will defeat the Germans in this new Patriotic War. And that is, in fact, where the term Great Patriotic War comes from. Uh, how are the Soviets being re reinforced and equipped? Large across the lake. They had that railway line along the shore of the lake, but it was tenuous. Most of the supplies were being run by sea or by uh, across the ice. Um, 
so um so you know this was uh just uh they, they were basically making stuff up as they went really um uh, getting what supplies they could across across the lake but but you know like I say, they were experienced at running stuff across frozen waterways, and they'd also had the experience of the first winter, so they knew how to do this. They're also feeding a smaller population, which means the same transport capacity can move a lot more military hardware uh, than it could in the first winter. Um, and they built up stockpiles of food in the city during uh, 1942, so they didn't have uh, dur during 1942, so they didn't have and 43, so they didn't have to try so hard in the winters that followed. Anyway, let's move on. Um, so we're now getting on to the advent of this gentleman here. So Kuchler is desperate to pull back to the Panther line. His divisions are dying in the front line, um, but Hitler won't let him, and he can't understand why. And then at this point, Zeitzler, who is the chief of the general staff, takes him to one side on a visit to um, uh, uh, Hitler's headquarters and says, it's because of stuff that's happening elsewhere. And Kuchler says, well, what's happening elsewhere? And he says, well, we're about to have two army corps surrounded down in Army Group South. So the Battle of Cherkasy is unfolding um, at this time. And to make matters worse, worse, um, we also have the British and the Americans landing uh, at Anzio. So although Anzio goes down in Western history as not a particularly successful operation, it has a profound effect in that it does distract German attention from uh, key events that are unfolding on, in the East. It also makes Hitler very, very reluctant to move troops out of the front line because he doesn't want anything moving unless he's you know, overseeing it personally. So um, uh, Gatchina or Krasnogvardesk is now in Soviet hands. There is a general withdrawal on the 27th of January. Um, Kuchler travels to Hitler's headquarters. So at this point, um, the uh, uh, two corps of um, the German 8th Army are about to be surrounded in the Cherkasy uh, salient. And Hitler summons all of the army group and army commanders to his headquarters to give them a, a lecture about the important of importance of inspiring the right degree of fanaticism in the troops, because this is how we're going to win the war. So at a time when you really, really need your army and army group commanders to be in the front line, nope, they're all summoned off to uh, hear the Fuhrer give them a firm lecture. And on the 30th of January, Kuchler is told by Hitler, you're being dismissed. Um, much to Lindemann's disappointment, it isn't going to be him who gets the job of commanding Army Group North. And in fact, by now, Lindemann, having been responsible for this whole mess by overstating the ability of his troops to hold the front line, he's now sending desperate uh, messages up the, up the food chain saying, my army's about to get overwhelmed and I desperately need reinforcements and it's terrible. And, you know, everybody up up the, up the uh, chain of command is saying, this is the same man who told us just a week or two ago that his army could hold out for the foreseeable future. And yet here he is now pleading for reinforcements. But this is not a good time to be calling for reinforcements because you need reinforcements uh, in Italy to deal with Anzio. You need reinforcements to deal with the encirclement around Cercassi and the whole of the northern sector is now collapsing. So what does Hitler do? He turns to his man, Walter Modell. Now, regulars to the show who have heard me talk about this, um, Darren, uh, with supplies coming down, uh, Lend Lease. Yeah, there's quite a lot coming down from the north via Murmansk. Large amounts of uh, supplies. In fact, when I was up in uh, the Highlands last week, one of the locks we went to to photograph uh, stags was where the Murmansk convoys used to form up uh, before they, they headed north. So, yeah, lots of supplies running around North Cape. A lot of stuff um, being brought across uh uh, the Trans-Siberian Railway, uh, American supplies landing in Vladivostok, and also supplies coming up through Iran um, and uh, across the border there. So huge amounts of the supplies. Um, Stachov's book, uh, Tragedy on the Neva, is actually a great read. Um, you have to take it with a little bit of um, caution, like so many German accounts. It's big on the suffering of German soldiers and what a great job they did. It kind of dodges the question of um, why were the Soviets so brutal and determined to kill every German they could capture, and what have the Germans been doing in the rear areas, etc. Um, and we may come back to Stalika if time allows. Um, 
But anyway, Walter Modell, the regulars of the show will know that he, I'm not a great fan of Modell. I think he has a vastly overrated opinion of himself and his reputation, I think, was overrated. You know, he is going to be credited with stabilizing the North. But in fact, as you'll see, the Red Army is just going to run out of steam. The same happens when he replaces Manstein in the South. He turns up usually when there's a crisis and the Red Army is in full flood. And that almost certainly means the Red Army is about to get to the end of its supply line leash. So he then gets the credit for stopping them, even though they would probably have been stopped anyway. But, but, but he is not all bad. So um, a rare moment, I'm going to uh, say something in praise of our man, Modell. Um, at one point, he, you know, he arrives like, a, like an absolute storm. Um, Kinsel, the chief of staff at Army Group uh, North, um, is accustomed to having his leisurely breakfast and then a leisurely meeting. He is summoned um, and uh, turns up at um, uh, Modell's, uh, in, in Modell's uh, conference room, uh, still wearing his pyjamas. And Modell, of course, is quite scathing about this. Kinsel then contacts Zeitzler and requests a transfer. And Zeitzler, who's chief of the general staff, replies to him along the lines of, you are aware that the Fuhrer is sending Modell to all the crises. If I have to start approving transfers, I'm going to be doing nothing other than tra transferring people instead of actually doing my job. Um, Modell has a rec record of this in the past when he has taken, for example, when he took command of um, an army in Army Group Center, the entire staff uh, all applied for transfer immediately. Um, he's not a popular man uh, with staff officers, not least because he hates the traditional staff officer. He's not a Prussian Junker and he doesn't like them. Um, and he makes no secret of his contempt and he, he's not... He is not a gentleman, shall we say. Um, but, you know, he has his strengths. So, for example, in this stage, one of his first trips is off to a Luftwaffe airfield near his headquarters, and he demands uh, to know why the Stukas are lined up and not airborne. And he's told that it's um, it's a bit misty and it's not really flying weather. And he turns to the um, uh, Luftwaffe commander and says, but it is trench fighting weather for my infantry, isn't it, Heroberst? And the Stukas are airborne 20 minutes later. So, you know, he's not entirely without his uses. And he's, you know, he's a he's a bully. But, you know, there are occasions when actually that's what you need, really. Um, but he now has to conduct a fighting withdrawal from the siege perimeter back to the Panther line. Inevitably, of course, Hitler is not keen on a retreat all the way. I'm sorry these maps have not come across as, I, I don't know, are, are they as cluttered as they look on my screen or um, can you guys see them rather better than I can? Um, they're all right. Okay, so um, you can see Leningrad is just out of the top north of uh, this picture. The Estonian frontier is roughly along the left, and left edge of this map and the Germans have to pull back to this. And Hitler does not want to pull back all the way, inevitably, having um, approved the construction of this fortified line along the Baltic states border, um, the Panther line. Instead, he now um, invents what he calls the, the Rollbahn line, which is an arbitrary line drawn roughly across the middle of this map to protect the main highways so that he can keep open his options for future offences. Well, you know, that's nonsensical. Uh, was the Panther line a line in name only? Well, actually, you know, it was not a, not as it was nothing like you know the Maginot line or the Siegfried line or the West Wall or or, the, or even the Atlantic Wall, but it was a darn sight better than the uh, the foxholes that the troops were occupying at the moment. In places it was well built, in other places, yeah, it was pretty poor. But the main point was it was much closer to supply dumps. So if you're fighting there, at least you're going to get decent amounts of supplies. Anyway, Modell now proposes to Hitler. He says, I have a cunning plan. And my cunning plan is what he calls um, Schild und Schwert, or shield and sword. So what he's talking about is, um, I'm going to use um, uh, 28th Corps, which is roughly in the center of this map, to hold an extended salient. Um, this is going to be the shield on which the Red Army will batter itself. They're going to bypass its left flank. There's 42nd Army there, you can see, pushing down towards the bottom left. Um, and as they do so, both of their flanks will be open, and that's where the sword will come in. I'll attack them with my panzer divisions, with um, the SS from the north, panzer divisions from the south. 
Now, those of you who are familiar with German uh, defensive doctrine will know that actually this is pretty standard. You hold the line with the infantry, you have your mechanized forces behind the front line you know, in an Avenger role to smash <clears throat> any penetrations. German counterattacks are 100 years old at this point. They've been doing it forever. Um, but man but uh, Modell's moment of success, if you like, is he manages to persuade Hitler that, no, 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 this is something entirely new, mein Führer. So I can, I can, you'll allow me to make some withdrawals because I'm going to mount this dazzling counterattack. And of course, you know, his star is sufficiently high in Hitler's um, esteem that he is allowed to do this. The shield bit works pretty well. Uh, 28th Corps fights its way back slowly. Um, but the, uh, um, the the counter strikes don't really oh that's much clearer isn't it the counter strikes don't really work out particularly well um, and in the end uh, the Germans pull back to the Panther line which is you can see at the top left hand corner here you can see a river running from um, Lake Pipers up to the uh, uh, Baltic Sea that's the Neva River uh, the beg of the Narva River and it runs through the city of Narva which is on the river at the very top. And so they've pulled back to that line. They hold a bridgehead around Narva. Uh, Wengler has been holding a town called Volosovo, which is in the upper center of the map. And um, it's known as known to the Germans as Wenglerovo because this becomes his personal fortress. Uh, he gathers uh, retreating units, uh, groups them together into this battle group. Doesn't hold the town for long, but he manages to pull out an awful lot of stragglers and gets them back more or less intact uh, to Narva, where the Germans continue to hold a bridgehead over the river um, throughout the uh, spring of uh, 1944. So they've managed to pull back, um, but they've taken pretty heavy losses. However, it's worth pointing out that yet again, the Red Army has suffered more losses than anybody else. Um, I'm going to jump back one moment to a very important event that took, took place on the 22nd of January. This was, if you'll remember, this is when Krasnogvardesk was changing hands. The uh, Iranian-bound bridgehead had linked up with 42nd Army. Um, yeah, there were quite a lot of uh, uh, armaments factories functioning in Leningrad. The uh, Kirov steel works were turning out KV tanks throughout the siege and they were just coming out of the factory yard and turning right and going straight into the front line. Um, lots of other manufacturing going on there. In fact, during uh, 1943, there were even munitions being shipped out of Leningrad to uh, supply other armies. Uh, so it remained a very productive industrial center, um, you know, once the first winter was out of the way. But 22nd of January, uh, Leningrad was hit by uh, German artillery. Nothing new here. This has been happening for 870 days. It is the last day that the Germans shell the city. That is the day, if you like, that the siege formally ends. So a week ago today, um, 80 years ago, the last German shells were fired at the city. Um, uh, and after that, the siege was officially over. Uh, gradually, life began to return to normal. People didn't really return in any significant numbers until after the war. But you could start walking the streets on both sides mm -hmm. of the streets. Some of the um, uh, some of the, the the camouflage around the buildings and other monuments began to be taken down. So this is a great great moment, and this is really the you know the start of a momentous year, 1944. At the beginning of 1944, you know the Germans are still they're still in a pretty bad state. Yeah, the, the swamps would have been frozen at this point, so you can move reasonably freely. But really, the main problem here is the wood, woods also. And also, although, you know, we've had a bit of climate change and now you don't get continuous freezing in this area through the winter. And in those days, you did more or less. Even then, you had days of thaw and, and everything that was not a hardened road would just turn to swamp. It would turn to mush. And even now, if you drive through this area, as I did when I went down to Signavino, most of those roads are gravel. Um, because the, the the Russians, even now, do not really have the resources to build proper all-weather tarmac roads. So at least gravel will survive the frost a bit better than um, a cheap tarmac road, which will just break up. So, yeah, um, movement in this area is always limited. So this is the end of the siege. So we're now going to talk a little bit about the legacy of what happens after the siege. There was no memorial built in Leningrad to the siege until after Stalin's death, because Stalinist historiography, the orthodox view of what happened during the war, was that 
it was a combined victory of the entire Soviet people, led by the Communist Party, which in turn was led by the infallible Stalin. And if we're going to mention any um, uh, uh, any city in connection with this, of course, it's going to be Stalingrad and not Leningrad. L Leningrad was never popular in Stalin's eyes. He didn't like the place. He regarded it as a bit too dare I say, Bolshe for, uh, for his liking, a bit too uppity. Um, yes, after the war, he did liquidate the uh, party leaders. Um, and, uh, you know, though every attempt was made to downplay the importance of the siege. Of course, it was important, but no more important than um, the fighting around Odessa or Brest-Litovsk or um, particularly Stalingrad, which was the epic uh, battle um, that turned the war. The, um, the mass graves that were created during the uh, siege, they were first uh, landscaped and turned into the, what you see there today um, in the late 1950s. Um, and when you go through those, um, it's very moving. There is an eternal flame. Um, there, are, it, there are stones saying this is a grave of civilians who died in the first winter. This is a grave of men of the garrison, whatever. This is fiction. These were mass graves. The, the stones were put up long after it was possible to identify who was buried there. But it gives people a place to mourn. It gives people a place to go where they can see their dead. The official Lenin, the memorial to the siege of Leningrad um, was, um, uh, was built in 1971, I think. It's in, a, on, in the center of a roundabout, um, three metro stops down from the center of, uh, of St. Petersburg. Um, typical um, brutalist Soviet architecture, these enormous concrete figures. Um, but a very, very powerful memorial. Um, and, you know, this is this is a memorial to the heroic siege of Leningrad. And yet the caption on it uh, reads, um, uh, 1941 to 1945, it is explicitly a memorial to the Second World War, not necessarily the siege of Leningrad. Yet, when you go into the underground part of it, underneath the roundabout, there is... Uh, the place is lit by these little lamps along the wall, one lamp for each day of the siege. Um, they play the Radio Moscow call sign, which was played to the city all the way through the, the terrible winters. Uh, it's a superb place to visit. Really, really powerful. Very, very haunting. Uh, lives with you all the time. So the Finns by now... Um, have pulled back towards their own uh, frontier. They can, they bear the brunt of um, a Soviet spring offensive, which effectively forces the, them to start negotiating and seek a way out of the war, which duly happens in August 1944. So they're still in the war at this stage. The Amber Room that Ian mentions uh, was um, to the south of Leningrad city itself at the Alexandra Palace, and the Germans stripped that out and took it off to Königsberg, where it disappeared uh, during the siege of Königsberg though one panel of it was returned to uh, St. Petersburg, I think by Helmut Kohl when he visited the city. Um, and most of the uh, amber room has now been restored, though of course with new panels because most of the amber from the original room disappeared in the siege. No one knows. Best thought is it's either on the, uh, on the uh, Baltic Sea bed having been sunk uh, or went up in the fires of, of the city. This picture here, the reason I've put this in is this, this is a good note on which to finish this story. This is a sketch by a woman who was 17 at the time. She kept a sketchbook diary of the siege, and pictures like this were seen by the Soviet authorities as too defeatist, portraying emaciated, thin people, depressed people. She was not allowed to exhibit any of these during the siege. No, a bit, beg your pardon, during the Soviet era all the way up to the end of the Soviet Union. She did not get an exhibition of all of her works. Only the more positive works were permitted. The first time her works were ever displayed uh, was in 1991 in Berlin. And she displayed all of her pictures there. At one point, a group of elderly Germans came uh, to see them. She took them on a tour. Talking to them, she very rapidly realized who they were. They were 18th Army veterans from the siege. At the end of the siege, um, and forgive me if I told this story in the previous talk about um, the siege of Leningrad, at the end of the siege, um, one of them came up to her and said, on behalf of all of my comrades, I want to apologize to you for what we did. Um, we 
came to destroy your city and ended up destroying our own humanity. And she said to him, um, our war was not against you individual Germans, our war was a war against fascism. And she added, there is fascism amongst us all. So if we jump to the next slide, one of the strongest images of the siege for me is this propaganda poster from the siege itself. Um, you can see this is very typical of the uh, propaganda posters produced in the Soviet era. Caption reads, death to the child killers. It's worth remembering that Putin's mother was a blockadnik. She survived that first winter. She would have seen mothers holding their dead children. And every night that Putin's missiles hit Ukrainian cities, I am reminded of this poster, and I'm rem reminded of the words of that artist saying, there is fascism within us all. And I think one of the greatest tragedies is that that particular lesson appears not to have been learned in the Soviet Union or in, indeed in modern Russia. And the legacy of it, I feel, is betrayed by the manner in which cities like Kharkiv, Kiev and other places are attacked by, um, uh, by the Russians. So very quickly to jump back to uh, Franz Walter Stahlecker, who was um, uh, head of the Einsatzgruppe A, um, and he was responsible for the Baltic Holocaust, and he then moved up in preparation for um, entering Leningrad on the coattails of the uh, German forces in order to uh, carry out uh, mass killings in the city itself. He, his base was in Krasnogvardesk, where he was caught in a drive-by shooting uh, in early 1942 when partisans machine-gunned um, a group of Germans standing outside his headquarters. He was hit by a bullet in the leg um, and was uh, treated in a field hospital. He was then evacuated by air first to Riga, where he underwent surgery for a ruptured um, femoral artery. And he was then put on a plane back to Prague, where his family were living. Either the surgery was not as successful as it should have been, or um, the suturing came adrift and he bled out on the flight. Uh, he was then given um, a hero's uh, burial by the SS. Um, frankly, um, I think my only regret on that is he didn't live to be shot by a firing squad or to be hanged, a brutal murderer. And, you know, um, yeah. Happy that he died. Um, on the left here is my book that is, was published uh, last year, which takes the first uh, phase of the, the siege up to the end of 1942. The second book, uh, Hero City, is going to be published later this year in September, and that is going to be um, uh, covering the story from uh, Operation Spark, the breaking of the siege ring through to the end of the siege and into the post-war uh, post era and the legends and the legacy of the siege. And it's, it's 7.57, so there you go. Bloody good job, Pritt. And it's good to give people a bit of a break before the next book is out because we're forever telling people to buy books, but phew, they've got a few weeks to save up their pennies. <laughs> That's good. Um, we have a couple of questions, uh, not many because you've covered everything. Um, the death toll, is it one of those sit, uh, you know, situations that's been revisited many times through the eras? I mean, you know, civilian yeah. losses, military losses. Yeah, so um, the, the overall statistic is absolutely brutal. More Soviet citizens died in the city and in the fighting around the city. So civilians and military combined. More died uh, in the siege of Leningrad, than British Empire war dead from both world wars put together. Mm. So you so you think of all the casualties in the First World War, you add to them the, what, 380,000-odd um, from the Second World War, and Leningrad uh, accounts for more. It's just an unbelievably brutal uh, number of, of deaths. Um, absolutely shocking. Um, not least because, as you saw from those maps, um, there are very few avenues of, of advance. And the, the obvious corridor to, for the Red Army to take was that very narrow one near the lake. So the Germans knew where they were coming. And if they attacked further away, they were going to have to come along one of the main axes, these uh, corridors where the road and rail links ran. So, of course, that meant the Germans knew exactly where they were going to come. So defending this was relatively easy. And in a way, the, the breaking of the siege ring and then the break, lifting of the siege a year later is all down to 
this long war of attrition of just grinding down these German divisions, which have been there since um, end of 1941. And okay, if the, the odd battalion gets rotated, rotated out, you get the odd uh, replacement draft, but these divisions are being ground down and ground down. And in a way, without that, the Red Army didn't have the skills to do this. You know, as I said before in a presentation, the Red Army is in the position of somebody who finds themselves in a brutal fight armed with a baseball bat when everybody mm. else is carrying swords. And it's too late, really, to learn how to use a sword. You've just got to swing that baseball bat as best you can and hope. Um, and all they had was brute force. And they carried on bludgeoning away until they smashed mm. them. Final question. A bit of a rabbit hole. But Grant, uh, our Romanian other nations uh, expert, any word on the Finns? How did the lifting of the siege impact the continuation of war? Well, I think by now the Finns had realized that... Um, stuff was not going well. Their whole point of being in this war was to recover the land they had lost in 1940. And they had largely done that. Um, uh, but now they realized that if the Germans are being driven away to the south, uh, we're going to be next. So sure enough, Gavorov now, having failed to break the Panther line um, in the spring or in, in sort of March 1944, turned his attention uh, to the Finns and proceeded to smash them uh, back to, um, uh, first of all, to Viborg and then beyond that. And, but, you know, again, massive losses because as the Finns demonstrated in the Winter War, this is not good country to attack through. Um, nevertheless, by now, Germany can't supply the Finns as, you know, lavishly as they as the Finns might have wanted. And the Finns are also running out of troops. You know, Finland is, doesn't have a large population. Um, although their losses have not been particularly massive, um, nevertheless, the army is running out of personnel, particularly junior officers and NCOs, etc. So they know that the, the game is up and they can't carry on. They're looking for a way out. They also know that the Germans are not going to be keen on that. So they've got to find a way out where they can get out uh, without the Germans, you know, um, attempting to mount a coup, etc. Um, and in fact, they finally exit the war um, in August. Well, we could ask lots more questions, but if we ask them all now and you answer them all now, we have no reason to invite you back. So it would be ridiculous. In the, in the good old tradition of leaving the audience wanting more, we will leave the audience wanting more. And I have to say, you know, again, hand on heart, I have hundreds of presenters on this channel, but you are absolutely a master at this, Brit. Your books are great. You're great. You're a nice person. You're a great historian. It's an absolute pleasure to sit and sip whiskey listening to you. I didn't interrupt you once during the 57 minutes you talked because I was just spellbound. So thank you, Brit. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. I will see you all again tomorrow. We're talking about B-29 reconnaissance missions into Tokyo. So it's off to completely the other side of the world tomorrow and lots more stuff coming your way. I've got a great infantry week coming your way. British content, American content, John McManus is coming back. Talk about Italy. There's so much stuff coming your way. So if you are new to the channel or if you're not new to the channel but have not done so yet, please consider becoming a patron or a channel member to help put some coins in Woody's coffers. But in the meantime, get out there, buy the books of Prits you haven't already got or put them on your wish list or whatever it would be. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you again tomorrow. Cheers. Bye.